High-speed rail is a bit of a running joke in Australia, and while I love Utopia, seriously, it's a great show, the truth is that as much as high-speed rail hasn't panned out yet, that doesn't mean it shouldn't. Countries around the world can and are continuing to build high-speed rail. And the case for Australia gets better every year. There are countries with less people, more land, and less wealth than Australia building high-speed rail today, and they don't even have the snowy. So in this video, I want to talk about why Australia should have high-speed rail and what it could look like. Hi, my name's Reese, and I run RM Transit, a channel about sustainable mobility around the world. To kick off the why for high-speed rail, I want to blast past the regular reasons people talk about it making sense for Down Under, and highlight something that I don't think Australians appreciate enough. Australia is a railway nation. Well, every time I make a video about trains in Australia, I am bombarded with comments that tell me the train system is horrible and you've clearly never been to Australia, neither of which are true. The truth is, if they think Australia's train systems are bad, they clearly have never been to North America, and the reality is, if you look at the comments for basically any video I make, besides on perhaps Japan, you'll see that everyone thinks their train system is the worst. Singapore MRT? Terrible. The reality is every big city in Australia has a fairly modern electrified railway system. And increasingly, these railways are implementing these same technologies you see across the world on modern high-speed railways, like 25 kilovolt overhead AC electrification and the European train control system, as well as modern multiple unit trains. Even though I think Australia kind of lags behind a country like Canada when it comes to something like urban metro systems, the reality is the modern electric suburban rail systems of Australia are far more relevant to building high-speed rail than this, this, or definitely this. And those suburban rail systems might even be useful for a high-speed scheme, depending on the direction things go. Across Europe, it's common for high-speed trains to run on suburban rail tracks for the last leg into the city. And the same thing could be true in Australian cities, assuming we can figure the rail gauge out. But Spain already has kind of done this for us. There are also the conventional reasons that high-speed rail makes a lot of sense. Australia has a solid economy, flights between Sydney and Melbourne are extremely popular and terrible for the planet, and there are well over 10 million people living on a potential Sydney to Melbourne corridor, and obviously that number is going to go way up in the coming decades. And of course, both Sydney, Melbourne, and other Australian cities are becoming larger, which only makes the case for connecting them up with fast, frequent trains more alluring. And these cities are expanding their transportation systems, with new lines, metros that aren't metros, and metros that are metros. All of these new investments in local transport infrastructure only strengthen the case for a high-speed link, or links for that matter. And a high-speed line doesn't need to be crazy expensive. While decades ago high-speed rail was rare and very cutting-edge, these days it's quite common, with over 20 different countries playing host to high-speed train services and more coming online every couple of years. Countries like Spain and Italy, which have NIMBYs and modern codes and design standards, show that you can build high-speed rail on the cheap and not in easy terrain. Now, of course, eventually any high-speed rail project in Australia is going to require tunneling, but Australia is no stranger to tunneling projects, and in my opinion, it's far better than countries like Canada and the US when it comes to tunneling. Most major cities in the country are building underground electric railway tunnels right now, except for Adelaide. And there are even other types of tunnels also being built, which we're not going to talk about because cars. So with the case for high-speed rail pretty clear and the value only set to inevitably increase as environmental concerns grow, populations increase, and transportation systems expand, it would be wise to get building soon, or at the very least set aside the land and space for future high-speed corridors. This helps maintain the value of such a system going forward, prevent big cost increases in the future, and also protect from nimbyism. But what would such a system actually look like? Fortunately, to tell you how things look today, I have Martin from the channel Tateset. Take it away. Hey there, my name is Martin and I live in Melbourne. Sometimes I want to go to Sydney to get my fix of ferries and double-decker trains. The current rail service between our two biggest cities takes about 11 hours and uses diesel XPT trains from the 1980s, which as many of you will know are our local version of the UK's Intercity 125. 
The XPT has a lower top speed than its British ancestor, partly limited by our lower line speeds, but it's also geared lower so it can handle our much steeper mainline gradients. A ground total of two trains currently operate each way between Melbourne and Sydney every 24 hours, with one running through the day and the other through the night. The day train provides a useful service between the many intermediate destinations along the route, but the end-to-end -end journey doesn't even come close to competing with flying. In fact, I can easily make a day trip to Sydney by air and be back home before the train has completed its one-way journey. However, for the overnight run, it's a different story. 11 hours is pretty much ideal for an overnight train. It's enough time to get a full night's sleep, plus dinner and breakfast at either end of the trip without any rush, and still make it to your destination before the day really begins. Something that requires a very early wake up if traveling by air. That's not to say that the service currently does this perfectly, however. The XPT only has one dedicated sleeping car, so the majority of passengers certainly aren't getting a good eight hours sleep. And the current timetable doesn't provide much slack to recover from delays, so the running time often blows out. But it is a good demonstration of what we could have. And if we want to get more Australians using rail for intercity journeys, night trains are a great way to make these long trips viable using existing infrastructure, because the length of the journey matters a lot less when you spend most of it asleep. There's currently a night train renaissance happening in Europe over many routes which are also served by high speed rail during the day, and the two modes can absolutely complement each other. A fleet of comfortable, purpose-built sleeper trains would make this a much more attractive option for passengers, and they could also be introduced on other similar length routes such as Melbourne to Adelaide and Sydney to Brisbane. And yes, this isn't a new idea, all those routes did have proper sleeping trains in the past. So I certainly hope that I'll get to travel to Sydney by high speed train one day, but in the meantime, an improved overnight service is something we could have much sooner and for a lot less money. Thank you, Reese. Investments could be made pretty quickly to improve the existing lines and facilities, to upgrade the speed, reliability, and level of service of the night trains. And since there's only one per night right now, there's only one direction to go, up. Speeding up and upgrading the infrastructure has a lot of benefits. For one, you could run more night trains every night, and you could also create more reliable night service by adding slack in the schedule. Uh, upgraded lines could also prevent things like flooding and landslides, which would make the rail lines more resilient. Even better, if you go fast enough, it's possible for trains to pull onto a siding in the middle of the night so that people can have a great night of sleep, stationary before continuing into the city. And these days, night trains can provide that. While most people's experience with overnight trains is kind of like the one that Paige Saunders had in a recent video done for the CBC, the truth is that night trains don't need to be antiquated. The boom in overnight services in Europe, for example, inspired Nightjet to procure new train cars that can only really be described as a pod hotel on wheels. They are awesome. Simply Railway actually has a video from the introduction of those trains into service, so I recommend checking that out, and imagining how much better it would be if Sydney and Melbourne were connected with nicer night trains with more travel options and a more modern vehicle. Now obviously the end goal is not a train journey so long that you can get a rocking night of sleep, but amping up night train service is a good way to cement the corridor's importance. Growing the market for intercity travel, normalizing taking the train between Sydney and Melbourne, and starting to take advantage of some early infrastructure upgrades. You'd probably want to get on with electrifying the service pretty quickly, which would be expensive, but you could do it with more affordable AC electrification, which requires less substations than traditional DC electrification used in suburban Sydney and Melbourne. You could simply pull the trains with dual mode AC DC locomotives. I think actually getting a high speed line built would be best achieved with phases. That allows you to start rolling out the benefits of a new high speed line faster, since high speed trains can also operate on conventional lines, while also building expertise and high speed know-how on the easier sections so you can later tackle the more challenging ones. Looking at the route trains currently take, a new high speed segment of line from Albury, which is north of Melbourne, to Goulburn, which is 170 kilometers southwest of Sydney, that would take a roughly 12 hour trip and make it a slightly more reliable 8 hour trip. And while this isn't the easiest terrain to build through, it's also far from the hardest. And while an 8-ish hour travel time is not great, it's still passable. You can get on a train before breakfast and be in Melbourne or Sydney for dinner. Now, doing the first section of high-speed line in between Sydney and Melbourne, where it's the flattest and the easiest, would probably be wise, so that expertise can be built up and you can move progressively outwards to the harder and more expensive sections. And to be fair, costs don't need to be that crazy, since high-speed lines can be built with pretty aggressive grades thanks to the high speeds and momentum of high-speed trains. 
I think extending high-speed service from Albury to the edge of Melbourne could take trip times from around eight hours to around five and a half. This would probably start to attract significant ridership and would be similar in length to something like Beijing to Shanghai. Now, obviously five and a half hours is not going to beat flying, but it's also CBD to CBD. So realistically, it's probably not going to leave you that much worse off. And you get to avoid the often demoralizing experience that is flying. Now, going beyond 5.5 probably means improvements to urban approaches. I think new tracks into Melbourne could probably save you around half an hour, and into Sydney, you'd save more like an hour. Now, this will be expensive. To be clear, going into Sydney, you're not tackling the Alps, but tunneling will be required. Though I do think the actual amount of tunneling required is probably overestimated by most people. But who is actually going to pay for that? Well, for one, the more riders you can get on an intercity service before you start talking about pricey tunneling, the higher value that tunneling will be. The reality is that even in the most optimistic scenario, at least initially, you're probably only going to have a few high-speed trains per hour. But this means lots of track capacity for high-speed regional services. These trains would operate at high frequency and high speed and would make more stops than the intercity services, allowing you to sail from city center to the deep suburbs in no time at all. This is actually something Korea already does with a number of its high-speed routes, and it makes a lot of sense for Sydney and Melbourne, allowing them to bring outlying towns into the orbit of the city. And assuming the high-speed line is built to adequate loading gauges, Melbourne could finally get the double-decker trains it so desires. Adding fast regional train service on high-speed tracks you are going to build anyways gets more people on the build side and adds more benefit to the cost-benefit equation. The question some might ask is, what about Canberra? And the reality is the nice thing about a line from Sydney to Melbourne is that you can plug Canberra into it pretty easily. Honestly, the tracks connecting Canberra to a high-speed line don't even need to be high-speed rated themselves. Now, to be fair, Canberra is pretty small, but it should become a bigger city, and it would only improve the case for high-speed rail. The reality is, after building a high-speed line from Sydney to Melbourne, the machine is probably efficient enough that you could connect Canberra up for not unreasonable prices, and doing that with the capital just makes sense. Similarly, short spurs connecting into the Western Sydney airport that's being built right now and Melbourne's airport could probably also be added late in the game for fairly low prices, and that would help remove cars from roads for people traveling to the airports for international or even interstate travel. Now, making this video, I am aware people will suggest that high-speed rail in Australia is pie in the sky and unthinkable, and that might be correct today. But the reality is, I don't think it should be, and I don't think it can be. Decarbonizing air travel, which is essential right now for people traveling between Sydney and Melbourne, Australia's two largest cities, is going to be extremely hard. There is no kind of zero emissions passenger aircraft, even on the horizon, that could handle the level of service needed for that route. And my personal thinking regarding this is we're going to get to a future where the climate crisis and environmental issues are so severe that we're going to be using any technical solution that is actually feasible today to try and reduce emissions. Building high-speed rail between Sydney and Melbourne might be challenging, it might be expensive, but it is very much technically feasible. And at the same time, as the cities grow bigger and Australia's population also grows, the case for high-speed rail is only going to get better and better we might as well start rolling the rails sooner than later. Thanks for watching.